everybody. Welcome to the Underwater Photography Show. As always, I am Matthew Sullivan. And I'm Alex Mustard. Uh, and today we have another of our Behind the Shot series. Um, so this, I think, is our fourth one. Uh, and today I pulled three of Alex's pictures. So we're going to go through them. He's going to tell us a little bit about each one, how he got it, the story behind them. Um, so with that, here we go. I've got the first one up. And I think it's this one. It was a really interesting choice um, by me from you. It's a relatively recent image shot last year. So shot yeah, within the last year, um, shot in Lembe. Um, but I would say this is so uncharacteristic of my photography that I was really interested that you chose it. You know, it's, it's not a picture I would ever choose. Um, the reasons I say it's uncharacteristic of my photography is that I very rarely sh set out to shoot black background macro. I just find it a bit too boring because it's what everyone else does. Not because it's bad, it's really good. And I always teach it and I always say to everyone, you know, you should always, you know, shoot black background macro. But I generally avoid it. But this one here, you know, I've gone to F22. I've gone to 1250th. I've dropped my ISO to 80th. So I've got a nice black background for this frogfish. And then also, you know, I always talk about not liking yawning frogfish shots particularly. Just because, it, you know, you can make a frogfish yawn relatively easily. And I think when photographers show off their yawning frogfish shots as some sort of, you know, um, mark of success, I always, you know, don't like that because I always feel it just shows that, you know, it doesn't show that you're good with frogfish. It shows that you're good at harassing frogfish um, or, you know, you bob them enough to their yawn. Um, of course, frogfish yawn naturally as well. Um, and I didn't harass this one, but I think he was yawning because of all the attention he was getting from the photographers, um, especially because he was sitting in this exposed position. So this was taken at, at, at Air Bajo 3, I think, at, in Lembe, um, one of the dive sites there. Um, and this frogfish was just sitting on this little finger sponge down at depth on the seabed and because he was just slightly off the seabed by getting the camera low I could shoot him against an open water background it was probably a dark rainy day which is why I shot him on a black background rather than normally I think I would have especially seeing a yellow frogfish I would have tried to get the blue background behind him yeah. just because that's kind of more my way of shooting but um, it probably was just too dark on this day so I just decided to go full on for the black background and then, you know, he did yawn during my pictures and I guess I decided that this was the shot I wanted to process. I, I you know, I love painted frogfish. I love them when they're really sponge looking like and they've got all the, the sort of the apertures of the sponge texture on their skin. Um, I like that this is kind of a nice sort of restrained yawn. It's not kind of all fully out in, its, in the face. It's not actually yawning at the camera. So maybe I wasn't the thing that was really annoying it. It was something off to the side. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, I like the shot, but it's, yeah. Uh, um, and I was shooting with the D850 and the 60 mil. I think a lot of photographers don't like using that wider viewing macro lens in Lembe, if they're on a full frame camera, but I really do. I love being able to get really close to subjects and yeah. being able to wrap my lighting around them if I want to. I think this one is shot with a little bit cross strobes, but it wasn't, it was just really to help bring out a little bit of shape and texture in the subject. I wasn't trying to do anything fancy with the lighting here or it was just that's kind of my more normal setup is to with a subject like the frogfish particularly. And it's definitely shot with two strobes, whereas quite often I'll shoot frogfish with single strobe. This is two strobe. Yeah, so I like this one, A, because it's, a, it's such a perfect perch. Um, mm. And at least I've only been to Lembe once. I didn't see any frogfish in such a nice pose. But also uh, here in Florida, most of the ones we have here are striated or hairies. So they don't perch up on things like this. Usually I've seen them in sponges or, or mm. off the bottom, but generally they're just flat on the sand. So seeing one on a, on a perch makes me a little envious too, which is one of the reasons I, I picked this because it's, it's cool to see. I like all the brittle stars on it. Yeah, yeah. Obviously I like, I like the bit of the light from the side that's, that's harsher because it lights up the, the bottom mm. part of the, of the fish and really shows off the outline. And like you said, with the painted frogfish, when they're, especially when they're small, they have all the, the pores from the sponges. Mm. Um, so it's a beautiful fish. Uh, if you're into frogfish, I suppose some people aren't. But the it would have been cool to see it on a blue background. But mo I mostly picked it just for the the, the setting, uh, mm. and because the fish itself is is beautiful. And let's be honest, most people would love to have this sort of portrait of the painted frogfish, myself included, um, with the nice clean background and the and the yellow really pops against it. Um, mm. But. Yeah, well, my next trip is Lembe, so it's good to start getting the motivation. Try I again. would say that although I have, you know, clear views about how I like my pictures to look, 
I do also try and vary my portfolio and don't always shoot everything in, yeah. in the styles of, of, of imagery that I like the most. It's very much a case of, you know, shooting to the conditions, shooting to the opportunity as well. You know, perched up like this, it was an obvious one to go for a really clean background. I would like to just touch because the we talked about the yawning. Um, mm. I think there's a it's pretty I don't I think it's pretty evident to see when frogfish are yawning because they're displeased versus when they because I've seen them yawn out of the corner of my eye and that's how I found them is they'll just be sitting on the bottom yeah, yeah. and yawn. So they definitely do yawn. Um, I think if they're doing it over and over and over again while somebody's photographing them, it's a pretty good indication that you're annoying them. Yeah, it might be time to might be time to leave. Um, but they'll also yawn to reset their jaws if they make oh, a strike, yeah, absolutely. which is uh, that's a little tip. If anybody wants to get to catch the yawn, if you watch one strike, they always yawn after the strike to kind of reset their jaws, and they might do two of them. So if anybody sees one strike and you want to get the yawn shot, um, they'll usually yawn mm -hmm. right after they strike. I'm, I, yeah, I'm sure part of the yawning is also, you know, those jaws are filled with high performance muscles because yeah. they have this incredibly fast strike. And I'm sure the yawn is, you know, the muscles can't be sitting all the time ready to go. You know, they must need that kind of yawn just to stretch them out and get them ready for the next strike at some point in the future. So and I'm sure that, yeah, the, the, there's, there's, a, there's a big natural part to the yawning as well. Um, right. Um, the next shot, I would say very much a shot in the style that I was wanting to shoot. Um, and, and that's this picture of Red Irish Lord. And I, I would imagine that this was sort of, this was a shot that I, I very much would have wanted when heading to God's Pocket up in the Pacific Northwest in BC in Canada. Um, I would have wanted to shoot these types of shots. It would have been on my, my you know, to get list is to get Red Irish Lords, but in their environment, because their environment is so attractive. I, I love an animal in their environment type shot. I think they're great storytelling images. And I think if you've got, particularly in the underwater world, really attractive, interesting, surprising scenery, using that as a backdrop for an animal in the environment shot is always going to give you a really powerful image. And so I, I shot this lots of ways. I actually prefer myself. I shot this fish three or twice, um, but I shot it both as a horizontal and as a vertical in this situation. And I much prefer the vertical composition of the two. I think the horizontal was a good choice for the, this because the vertical would only be small on the screen. Because um, the vertical, I was able to get like a bit of sunburst at the top mm -hmm. and, and I like how the reef looks. And it's the two shots, you'd hardly know that they were taken at the same location because they look so different, but they are. And then I also shot exactly the same Red Irish Lord in the same sponges a few days later with a macro lens, um, which is kind of quite funny to have, have a shot of the same fish, but shot several days later, but sitting in the same sort of area. Um, but I, yeah, I, I mean, this is for me, is you know one of the things I always want to get in that part of the world is Red Irish Lords, which are very characterful, often very colorful fish with that big eye um, in that environment. And then it's just a case of where you place them in the frame. You know, you want to, if you're going to shoot them relatively small in the frame, you don't want them in the middle. And it's quite fun just to play around with the compositions and move them around the frame. Because th th there's got to be an element so kind of with a picture like this of the, the viewer discovering the fish. Yeah. You know, you don't want them taking 10 minutes to discover the fish because they won't be looking at your picture for 10 minutes. But you, you just want it to be not where they were expecting it. And then, oh, wow. Oh, yeah. OK. I'm now seeing the picture differently. And I think that extra level of engagement that you, you bring bring with that slightly delayed response to the picture when they when it first flashes up on the screen is an important part. So, yeah, I love the, those yellow encrusting sponges, the red soft corals, the the white uh, metridiums, the some, what are they called? Anemones. Yeah, primos, that's the word, um, that, that dominate the habitat there. And I'll always spend lots of my dives in and around the most colourful scenery looking for subjects to, to pull out of them. So, And that was very much the case with this one. The only unusual thing about this shot with the D858 15mm fisheye, so just at 15mm, um, was that I, was, I, I took with me my normal big dome to Canada and my small dome thinking I might use the small dome on one or two dives, but we had quite poor visibility or very poor visibility during my trip there. And I ended up using the mini dome almost all the time, which I never normally would with that lens. 
Um, and that's why I shot at F-16 was because I knew I was using the media dome. I was getting very close to things, but I wanted the depth of field. I wanted the corner sharpness. So it's a bit more shut down than I would have shot um, with a different lens. If I'd been on the Nikonos like you were using up there, I'd have probably been at F-11 or something for this type of shot. Yeah. Um, but the F-16 is, the, is really to counteract the blurring effect of using a, a four inch or 100 mil dome with the with that lens it works with it but the corners go pretty crappy so f16 sort of solved that and then it was bright enough to be at, at just at iso 400 and a 40. it's interesting that you said this is bad visibility because i think that's probably about twice as good as i've ever had up at god up at god's pocket and i've never had blue water there which i think is one of the reasons that this stood out to me yeah uh, is because you have all those colors that you you get no matter what time you're there, which are spectacular in and of itself, but they contrast so well with the blue. Yeah. Because um, I've only ever seen green or brown water up there. Um, oh, I'm that brown one. Yeah. Ugh. So I would like to see blue someday, but this picture mm. stands out really nicely to me for that. And because this is a type of image, like you said, putting the animal like sort of in its environment without being extreme close focus wide angle, that's a, that's a type of image I struggle with. Um, and I, but I think this one's you know perfectly executed, uh, and red iris lords are, are iconic Pacific Northwest fish, so this is kind of an iconic Pacific Northwest image, um, and that's one of my favorite regions in the world. So I'd also emotionally am biased towards it as well. Yeah, yeah, and this is very much shot as a magazine image as well, which is also another reason not to have the central subject. Is you know yeah. this was shot very much to be used as a double page spread in a magazine. You know, so there's areas, you know, I would expect a picture like this would be a great opening image for a, 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 across a two pages in a magazine going, you know, God's pocket and then a block of text on the right hand side, yeah. you know, or something over the, over that. Um, so, yeah, very much sort of the thinking behind it. Right. And then the final picture is not with a D850 and it's a lot further back in time than the previous two um, taken, I think, in 2006. So, yeah, so 18 years ago um, with a D80 um, and 60 mil macro lens of a um, leafy sea dragon taken in South Australia. Um, and the settings I use for this is this picture is not cropped at all. So it's F13, but you can see it's still quite limited in depth of field because of that. Um, and shot at a F13 to try and have enough depth of field to keep it sharp. And then at a 50th of a second to allow the the ambient light to come in the background um, rather than shoot it on a black background. I really wanted that balanced light look, which is kind of quite characteristic of my macro even back then. And then it's just ISO 100 because the D80 was a, an old, old sensor and above ISO 100, it wasn't any good in, in terms of image quality. <laughs> so yeah, so that's kind of the, the story to it. Um, the, this was um, the first day I'd ever seen a leafy sea dragon. And it was a trip that I did back in 2006 I went with my friend Shannon Conway, who was um, sort of a, a wealthy, successful um, British guy who retired to Australia. Um, and I was a very poor underwater photographer at the time. Um, but he agreed to do these road trips with me where we we did them on an absolute shoestring budget in Australia, um, where we rented cars and drove rather than take flights and <laughs> things like that. Um, so we'd been up in New South Wales, up around Sydney, and we drove across country to Adelaide for a whole day and then rented diving equipment down in Adelaide, rented weights, and then drove from Adelaide all the way out to, um, to this was taken at Wool Bay, which is one of the, the jetties, probably about four or five hours outside of Adelaide. Um, and we were staying in this tiny little mobile home, just two of us in bunk beds. And it was, we just arrived that day, unloaded all our stuff into the mobile home, which was now full of all our stuff. And then went and now with an empty car, went out to the local jetty to go diving. And we went in and all the Australians had told us, oh, leafy sea dragons, they're very rare, very well camouflaged. You know, you might do five dives and not see them. And then finally you'll find one. And, you know, I was like, oh, wow, gosh, we better have our eyes peeled. And I'm very good at spotting stuff um, just from years of diving. And we went in the water and in about the first five minutes of the dive, I think I'd found three. And we ended up finding five on that dive. And I had both cameras with me. I had the D2X, which had the wide angle on and the D80, which had a macro on, which were my two cameras at the time, and um, did loads of shots with both of them. We shared them around. We had you know, more than one Sea Dragon each, so we had really nice, relaxed encounters, only obviously the two of us diving, um, no one else there at all. 
Um, and we came out the water that day and I, I got this picture underwater and it was, you know, I, I knew I had a really great shot. It looks just like this on the back of the camera. Um, and we came out the water and we were so excited that evening when we, we stopped diving. Cause it was kind of the end of the day. We'd traveled all day. We got one dive in, got good shots. And we were just like, Oh my God, we're here for another four or five days. There's no one else around. And we've got this jetty with four or five or three or four, four or five, you know, leafy sea dragons around it. We are going to get the best leafy sea dragon shots anyone's ever got. Um, and we sort of went to bed super happy and we woke up the next day and there was this howling gale that stopped us diving for two days. And then the following two days, the water was like soup. So our four days, which we thought we were going to get the most amazing portfolio of leafy sea dragon shots ever created, ended up being basically limited to this one day. But I have to say that this shot, I knew from that moment, I knew from the moment I took it, it was a really special shot. But I sadly, I don't think did enough with it. I didn't enter in any competitions when it was new because um, up until 2006, I'd done like I did um, two books in one in 2005, one in 2006. And in 2006, I started doing colder water diving. And one of my first trips was South Australia. And the aim of that was having done a book on on diving, a book on coral reefs. I wanted my next book to be all about temperate waters and, and those sorts of things. And because I've been sort of been offered you know, books very easily at that stage of my career, I was like, right, I'm not, I'm going to keep hoard all these special images up for a few years for the next book. Um, and so when I took this picture, I hid it. You know, I, I mean, I'm, it, it went online, but I didn't let any magazines publish it. I didn't put in any competitions. And I always said, when the book comes around, that's the year I'll put it in the contests because I knew I thought it was a really great shot. Um, and um, so I sort of sat on it for a, for a number of years, never let anyone publish it. Um, and then in the end, the book offer never came. I'd sort of been so used to being sort of being asked to do books. It never occurred to me I might not get asked to do a book. So <laughs> the book never occurred. So I never actually um, put this into any big competition or anything. It's become a very well-known picture because it's, I think, one of the most memorable shots around of a leafy sea dragon. Yeah. Um, it's the only shot I got. Um, we did go, we actually moved to another area and had did quite a lot more photography with them. We went to Kangaroo Island. We went around to Rapid Bay Jetty. We dived in Edith, Edithburg on that trip as well. Um, and we did get more shots of them. But I never again got a single frame where I had double eye contact. Yeah, it's um, tough. Just, just this one um, on my first ever dive with a camera with not very good autofocus and it just happened to nail it. And then last year, I actually finally reprocessed this shot using super resolution. Um, in, and this is, this is actually the super resolution process version because I just I lifted the shadows slightly more than the other version. Only I'd see the difference between the two. They're very, very, very little difference. Just to help it print a little bit better in magazines. And um, the picture is so good. Like, it's so clean. It's amazing how, you know, you, at the time I was like, oh, the D80's got an awful sensor. But you put it through super resolution and it's a 50 megapixel file. And it looks great at 100%. You zoom in and it's, it's great. You know, I'm just, I, I think I, I did an, an online video on my own YouTube channel about, you know, at the time I processed it. And I was, you know, I zoomed in and showed everyone the full resolution of it. And it's crazy that, you know, you had a good lens on those old sort of 10, 12 megapixel cameras. And, you know, you up the resolution to 48 megapixel with super resolution and they, they hold it up if you shot it well. And yeah. yeah, this shot here, it's, you know, there's a, a few specks of backscatter that are removed from it. And apart from that, it's uncropped. It's just, this was the shot I got. The, mm. the double eye contact is, I mean, I haven't shot sea dragons. I mm. hope to someday, but even with seahorses, getting them to look at you with both eyes is nearly impossible. And if they do, it's like done. Yeah. And and that's what this was. Yeah. And then they're often cockeyed. But and <laughs> unlike a seahorse, a seahorse you can sit in front of the sea yeah, dragons are kind of swimming. moving all the time. So you're yeah. kind of positioning yourself in front of it. And it's just, yeah, I have to say that, um, I know most people who've gone to shoot leafy sea dragons in the last 18 years since I took this picture, are aware of this shot and yeah. i see everyone who goes there tries to get a version of it and no one's got a version of it and i know that yeah, if i went back i wouldn't like get a version of it it's, it's like my <laughs> very well-known boha snapper shot that was in the wildlife mm -hmm. photography many years ago i've gone back to the red sea every year since i took that picture and i've never been able to get another version of it 
You know, it's just one of those things where it yeah. just all lined up at that one moment and you can go there with exactly the same equipment, knowing exactly how to do the shot. And you just don't get that moment of luck. And but that's it's why it'd be a so picture cool. that I show for the rest of my life, I'm sure. That's why photography is so cool. Is you can, like you said, you can go back and shoot the same thing a thousand times and it doesn't mean you're going to be able to recreate that same moment or get the opportunity, even if the... We might not even get the opportunity to it. You might never get a sea dragon looking at, at you with both eyes. Mm -hmm. And if anyone's familiar, I've again, I've not seen them, but I've seen lots of videos. They also do this thing. So they get yeah. they're in the water. They're kind of doing this as they're moving side to side. So, so to get one like that is they're quite the they're slow moving and they are quite big, um, yeah. which I think um, you know. And, and but I think what I've done with this one is I was like kind of just st trying to stay in front of it to try and get you know pictures of its face. I had a macro lens on, of course. That's what I was going for. And um, I think what has happened here is I, it, it was probably coming towards me and it's kind of actually at this moment going, oh, I don't want to go any closer to this guy. Yeah, and it's right. trying to kind of rear, rear up and back away slightly um, or something, you know, along those lines. And therefore is looking at me because it's kind of trying to basically avoid me as opposed to ignore me um, at this particular moment. Um, but it was, you know, it was all, all pretty, pretty cool. What was interesting is Shannon, um, we actually, I think it was in the third edition of Martin Edge's book. Um, he took a very nice picture um, with a macro lens head on on a leafy sea dragon on the same, uh, the same trip. And his shot was black background, very, very head on. So very angular, very symmetrical, but without the eye contact, without the green background. And, you know, his shot, very classic, very nice. But it was really interesting how two photographers basically using the same lens on the same subject, you know, on the same trip, um, took, you know, how just small differences in, flat, you know, I was really focused on eye contact, really focused on the green background, the open, you know, I like that look. Whereas he was very much more the overall composition of the whole frame being very balanced and the impact of the black background. And, you know, just in, it's just very interesting how two people's different sensibilities can can work in in different ways with the subject yeah. right we've been rabbiting on for ages so <laughs> um, i'll sure bring us back to this thanks everyone for watching the underwater photography show we'll be back again very soon